Welcome. Welcome, my friends, to the Beggars and Brawlers podcast. This is episode 58, recorded Tuesday, the 18th of October, 2022. And today I have an interview with fellow Alchemy of Sorrow author Intisar Kanani on her story Twice Domesticated Dragons, no spoilers, uh, plus the bonds of writing grief, the beauty of writing it short, and the menace of garden gnomes. Intisar Kanani writes Mighty Girls and Diverse Worlds. She's the author of the Dauntless Path novels, Beginning with Thorn, as well as Assemble Chronicles. Intisar, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much, Levi. So great to be here. It's awesome to have you because I feel like we've been talking to each other since this thing got started in text format on our Discord server. Yes. <laughs> and I guess a little bit in person on Zooms for that panel we did, but it's just cool to like, yeah, as I do the series. Out. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I feel like like we've built this kind of community um, because we all write a particular kind of fiction, or we wrote these stories, and yeah. Well, I think uh, I I think that the group coming together around a theme like grief and healing uh, just brought us closer in a way that like other groups that I've had that have come together around you mm. know whatever fantasy theme like I mean mm, that was cool, yeah. but this was this was digging deep. Um, yeah, this a lot of us. Yeah. Yeah, I felt like we couldn't help but putting ourselves into our stories and like, and whenever we talk about them, we end up talking about ourselves and our experiences with grief and, and hope too, because it's just so baked in. It is. But, but yeah, like a, an anthology that's just like heroic people or like action or something. It's like, hey guys, we all like action. This is cool. <laughs> <laughs> Not as strong of a bond. <laughs> I mean, it could develop into one, but I feel like we were kind of set up to to um, to just connect more deeply. And then I think also doing the Kickstarter together, and we were yeah. all in it to, um, you know, root for the success of this project and do everything we could together for it. And so I think that also um, just it was really cool to be part of this group of authors and get to know everyone in a way that I don't think I would have in another kind of project. Yeah, I feel the same way. I'm sad that like the book is going to come out and we're going to run out of things to do together. You know, it's like, wait, can we do another one? <laughs> right. <laughs> and the I mean, I'm willing to tear another hole through my soul if that's what it takes. <laughs> totally. Yep. I, you know, like I need wounds. <laughs> Makes me a better writer, right? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Just at least a more, a more weepy writer, one. But... <laughs> yeah, you know, like what well, we we need fantasy needs more weepy writers. <laughs> <laughs> so that's actually something that I wanted to ask you about because the like I love the balance in your story of like whimsical, like the the very concept of the gnomes, which I think we'll get into a little bit um, when you yeah. when you read the selection from it um is so whimsical and yet like there's also this like you know like really deep and emotional part of the story um yeah. and I don't know the story behind the story <laughs> did you have this story already or did you write it for it and more what I'm wondering is like did it start whimsical and then you were surprised by where it went or like what was the genesis of it yeah that was uh so the <laughs> the genesis of it um, was that I, uh, at one point when, um, you know, as, as writers, we have, we have newsletters and I had an onboarding sequence for new newsletter subscribers. And one of my newsletters would talk about, uh, or one of my welcome, uh, emails would talk about like magical creatures. And, um, I would always ask the new subscriber, you know, what their favorite magical creature was. And I'd ask nice. them to write back to me and, um, and it was fun and I would get, you know, mm -hmm. all kinds of like griffins people like this people like that and then one day I got this message from this guy and he was just like look I don't know about magical creatures but let me tell you what I hate garden <laughs> I was like really <laughs> you know and he goes you ever write a story about people destroying garden gnomes? I will <laughs> eat that up. <laughs> that's I was awesome. like, well, that's really interesting. And I have no idea what to do with that, but I'm going to put it in my back pocket. <laughs> totally. um, and, uh, and I kind of played with it and I was like, well, if garden gnomes are real, right? Like they were, they were, they were an actual menace to society mm. instead of these cute little ceramic decorations that people put in their backyards. Right? Like, 
what would their natural predator be? And of course there's no mm. natural predator. So then how do we create a natural predator mm, uh, nice. for garden gnomes? And that's where my twice domesticated dragons came from. And at that point I was like, all right, I've got, I've got like a cat and mouse story, <laughs> so to speak. Mm. And I have no plot. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't actually know what this is about other than mm. dragons eating gnomes. <laughs> <laughs> which is entertaining um, in itself i mean i know i was and and, and it was uh, kind of a contemporary mm -hmm. fantasy you know alt reality setting which i really haven't written much and mm -hmm. um i wanted to experiment with third person point of view because um mm -hmm. up until now i've really only successfully written first person point of view yeah <laughs> i write third person and it just sounds really dry and boring so um I wanted to kind of come back and give it another shot. And then um, one day I was, I think I was just driving somewhere. Driving is really good for me as a writer. Mm -hmm. And I really miss it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the pandemic yeah. has taken away, taken away much of my driving. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, I was just like, oh, it's about a, a young girl refugee. Mm -hmm. um, and as soon as I knew that, the story just kind of clicked together. Mm -hmm. This girl mm -hmm. is just trying to hold herself together. She's trying to hold her family together. Mm -hmm. um, her, you know, her. She's she's carrying her whole family. There isn't mm -hmm. a, a there is a parent there, but they're dealing with grief and trauma, and they're not able to carry her the way they should. And so she's stepped up for her and her siblings. Um, and so it became this much deeper story of, you know, the traumas that, um, that young children carry and, mm -hmm. um, how hard it is. Uh, and then realizing that, that there are people that, um, who can be there for you. There are, you know, maybe there's someone you just met, um, maybe there's someone that has failed you before, but can finally step up in this moment. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and so it became a much deeper, <laughs> much deeper story from this kind of whimsical <laughs> totally. story. Um, and I, I wrote it probably a year before mm. um, Virginia reached out to me to see if I wanted to be part of the anthology. And it was one of these, you know, uh, and I you know I, Virginia talked about this uh, for herself, for how she created the anthology, which is that there really isn't a market for mm. these stories of deep grief that mm -hmm. are that are in a fantasy setting. And so I didn't really have a place to put this story, even though I had mm. it. Um, so when Virginia reached out, I was like, oh, perfect <laughs> um and it gave me a gave me a place to then revisit the story and develop it further totally yeah your story for me somehow is like the like it's the first one I think of in the anthology because it's the first one that I read when you put it into oh, yeah. the you know because we a lot of us critiqued each other's stories it was yeah. the first one I read it before I read Virginia's um <laughs> so it's like the heart of the anthology somehow to me but oh, thank you it makes so much sense that you say that it clicked together. Like I, one of the things that's been fascinating to me in doing this series of talks with people and talking about how they wrote it is like how like mythically our writer's brains work when they're working well. And like, we don't like consciously see these connections, but to me, like reading it this second or third time or whatever it was, um, like the connection between user's experiences, the main character and the twice domesticated dragons and how they have this like, uh solidarity for each other and yeah. compassion and like the dragons become this like trickster but also like uh i don't know like guiding figure or protector figure it's like so cool yeah. didn't see it the first time also <laughs> we were talking before <laughs> the podcast about another one that i didn't see um but it's just like woven together so well and then yeah the the gnomes like they work in the way that you're describing and also they make sense to me in terms of being a refugee or someone who's just come to the country and not feeling totally comfortable. And this is the most mainstream and also weirdest thing. Like, why are people putting ceramic creatures in their yard? Like, and, and then that becoming like a, a social status thing of like, you have all this like gnome trash in your yard. So like, we're gonna judge your family, you know? And it's like, this is your problem. Like, I, we didn't have gnomes in my country. Like, it makes so much sense, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah, it just feels like yeah. a basket that's woven so tightly. Yeah, I, 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 I you know that the the that the mythical writer's brain. I think you have that. <laughs> it's that it really is. Um, I mean, sometimes I look at my stories and I'm like, did I? I didn't actually think of this, did I? <laughs> um, and I've, I've come to embrace that I'm very much an intuitive writer, and that mm. my subconscious plays a huge role in how I develop my stories, um, which is really hard to 
then pin down and, and use because you're like, yes, mm -hmm. I'm half unicorn and half like <laughs> person at a keyboard. <laughs> like, yeah. And I, I don't know how to <laughs> bring them together. Um, but uh, but this story definitely was one that that just different, like very disparate elements just suddenly clicked together. And mm -hmm. um, and and it, the story came together very quickly once I knew what it was about. Yeah, that's um, another. So we were talking before we started uh, recording about how uh, the the tension in the family and user's relationship to her dad and how, like you said, he's dealing with trauma in a different way. And she's got a lot of anger about that. It feels so real. And I love like that you take the time to set it up in that relationship and that it has a payoff. Mm -hmm. um and I was curious like in speaking about like you know being intuitive like did you see that coming uh in the end like the way that their relationship shifts or is that just like here's a moment and this feels right I I saw it once I knew that it was about it was about yes or I was about this you know young refugee child um I you know all of my stories outside of this anthology also have a thread of hope through them. So I knew mm. that there would be a point of healing for her. And I mm. knew what she most needed healing with was her family that mm -hmm. um, she had, you know, she lost a parent already that her second parent was physically present and emotionally absent. And um, that she, that this would be kind of a story of that would, that would help her break out of her sorrow and help her parent break out of the the paralysis they were in to uh, to be able to kind of start holding each other mm -hmm. um, as they needed to be held. Yeah, I thought I just thought it was so beautiful how like in the beginning they have so much separation and she has so much anger from the same source and you know dealing with it in different ways and I don't actually know how her dad feels towards her but like mm -hmm. you know it's it's totally understandable how she feels and it's also like tragic because they should be together in this and yeah, yeah their family needs that that tighter connection yeah um yeah I was it was actually one of the questions I was going to ask um is you know like I think this is this is kind of the only like uh modern like setting that you've written mm -hmm. so obviously like yes or doesn't appear in your other books <laughs> no. but does this uh does this story feel like uh thematically connected to your other works um or like that the main characters have resonance yeah I mean I I think I, I I tend to write um young women I tend to write mostly uh young adult stories um and a lot of it is is in essence you know finding uh your strength um, mm. or finding healing or a way forward um, in whatever way that might mean for your character. So, I, you know, I have, um, <clears throat> I have a series called The Dauntless Path where the initial story uh, is titled Thorn. And it's a retelling of the Grimm's Fairy Tale, The Goose Girl. And mm. my main character comes from a history of abuse, mm. uh, which is, you know, is abuse and trauma are actually in some ways interwoven and in some ways very, very mm. different experiences um, because abuse can be, you know, it, trauma, trauma can be general trauma, um, not necessarily visited upon you by someone whom you trust or who should have been protecting you. And abuse is, is very much, you know, mm. being, um, being betrayed by someone in a position of authority or trust in your in your life a lot of times uh, not always but a lot of times so um you know thorn is very much um a story of learning to survive abuse um and finding your own strength in yourself and um i don't i don't tend to write characters who you know turn into these you know super ninja magical sorceress <laughs> you know capable type people they mm -hmm. the way they discover their strengths is to basically dig deep into who they actually already are mm. and and that's and that's what carries them forward so with with Thorin you know she is a very kind of kind person and her carrying the day is through radical compassion and kindness um it's it's not through learning to outwit the sorceress, right? <laughs> because she <laughs> yeah. can't, you know, <laughs> like she, the sorceress is a hundred years old and extremely mm -hmm. dangerous. 
Uh, <laughs> I'm 16 and I come from, you know, a history of abuse. What I can do is, is utilize my own understanding of compassion and cyclical violence and what it is to be mm. abused and mm -hmm. find a way forward from there. And so um, in that sense, like Yosra's story also is, you know, Yosra um, finding strength in those around, in, around her. She's always so used to being strong um, that for her is about being able to lean on someone mm -hmm. and that that is an actual strength for her. Um, and I think that's something we we tend to look at as a weakness in American mm -hmm. society, right? Like if you're strong, it means you don't need help and actually know a sign of strength is is accepting support when you need it and accepting mm -hmm. love and letting people be there for you in whatever way they can um, and, and, and being there for them as well. And, um, and so that's kind of a lot of her arc is just being willing to open up her griefs and lean on someone um, and find that they actually are there for her. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. I think that really shines in the story and uh, I think some of the people who've reviewed our anthology have been amazed by the connections between them, but that particular theme of people who are dealing with something very difficult, um, finding ease in it or finding comfort by finding someone else who is there too, feels so powerful and like comes up in so many of the stories. Yeah, it does. But yeah. I think that's part of, you know, sorrow and grief can feel so isolating. And um, I remember I read um, Sarah Choren's uh, editor's note at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And every time I read that, it like breaks me open. And I, <laughs> I know, I know. Um, but what her doctor said to her and the mantra that she kind of ascribed to this anthology is that, you know, I may not know what you are feeling, but I know grief. Mm -hmm. And it is so true that, you know, no one necessarily knows what your particular grief is. Mm -hmm but we all know grief and learning to n allow yourself to, to reach others and to be reached by others um, and to navigate grief, not alone or, you know, but rather in company with those who care about you. Um, it's such a, it's such a hard thing, but it's such an important thing. Yeah. I feel like there's this vulnerable shift where like it takes us admitting that we're in pain and that we need help. And um, yeah, in some ways, I feel like this, I was talking to Virginia and I said that like, for me, sometimes it's hard to even access those emotions myself. I think I've been, been told as most US males that it's not okay to feel. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so and, and like, if, they, if you do feel you're only allowed a certain set number of emotions <laughs> right I get anger and stoicism and stoicism isn't really feeling so no. basically I can be angry or nothing a little bit yeah. excited but don't lose your cool <laughs> <A little bit excited. laughs> that's what oh. I get uh yeah and so this that's is a like, bum deal I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> you were all getting bum deals I mean we got a lot of work to do but <laughs> right. it's but one of the yeah like you know like we we're writing our characters getting vulnerable and the stories hit hard and I was just mentioning to her that for me reading this anthology is so good because it pushes me past like my sort of barrier to feel and it gets me into a state where I can feel vulnerable and kind of access those emotions that uh naturally are a little bit held off from me um and I think that that's such a wonderful gift of fiction like for us like when we're writing you know like the emotions come up so much but also like in reading sometimes we need a little bit of a push to notice there's something there or to have the cry that we need or whatever and yeah it's just awesome that we put a bunch of tear jerkers together in a book <laughs> <laughs> but like we said i love that that yours balances the like the tear jerking with like some really humorous stuff too and then also some whimsical just, kind of yeah, yeah and some totally real family drama that's just like like I had it this morning with my kids you know like oh, no. we're just annoyed at each other and seriously are you doing this and like all of those feelings yeah yeah so um, um, I think one of my favorite things is is the number of reviewers who have been like I will never look at garden gnomes the same <laughs> <laughs> I won't for sure <laughs> <laughs> so shout out like to that guy in my email <laughs> i know i hope he feels so vindicated i hope he's still on the list and he finds out 
Um, cool. So with that, do you want to read us a little bit from the story? Sure. Yeah, I can. Um, I think I'll start from the very beginning because um, it makes the most sense with the, with the backgrounds, with the nouns. So this is twice totally. domesticated dragons. No, Baba's voice echoed up the stairs from the kitchen, the sound of it unnaturally high, edged with terror. It was a sound she had heard before, would never forget, and it brought with it a dizzying wash of panic. Yusra set her toothbrush on the edge of the bathroom sink, telling herself there was nothing to fear her in this land they'd come to, nothing at all. But then her father cried, his voice getting quieter, get away from there, Yusra, coming. Yusra sprinted down the hall, taking this, took the stairs at a run and burst through the kitchen entry as her little brother pulled himself up to place his palms against the screen door, which, thankfully, had been dutifully locked the night before. Baba grabbed Ilyas a moment later with shaking hands, calling for her other brothers. Harun! Daoud! His voice fading to a labored whisper. Much good that would do if the boys couldn't hear him. What's wrong? Yastra demanded, her voice sharp. Baba's beard was scruffy, his shirt rumpled and bearing coffee stains from three days ago, even though she'd done the wash. She took Ilyas from him, wrapping her arms around his wriggling form. He was her charge, and she wasn't going to risk his safety to their father if something really was wrong. Harun! Daoud! she called, just in case they were needed. Don't look away. Baba turned his wide eyes to the backyard. Look away from the yard? Baba hadn't even been watching Ilyas, who needed watching first. She couldn't depend on her father. She knew it, had known it for a lifetime or perhaps only a year that felt like one. Murmuring endearments to the squirming brown-haired toddler in her arms, Yusra looked out the window just as Baba said, there's more now. Yusra's stomach sank as the realization hit her. She knew what she'd see through the window long before her eyes found their small, sturdy forms. Of course there were more, again. The things were a nightmare and Yusra knew all about nightmares. She forced herself to assess the yard as Daoud and Harun ran into the kitchen. Gnomes, everywhere, at least two dozen this time, their scarlet pointed caps glinting in the sunlight, their sinister sneers wide beneath their hard ceramic mustaches and beards. How are there so many already, Harun cried, looking out at the screen door. He sounded so much older than his seven years. We cleared them out only a month ago. You know what happens if even one escapes, Yusra said. Everyone knew how gnomes bred, skulking through dumpsters, gathering discarded stoneware and ceramics, and molding them together, somehow, without water or a kiln, to form new gnomes. A single gnome could fashion an army in the space of a few weeks if left unchecked. Yusra shivered, to think people had once considered garden homes cute. We need a dragon, Dawood finally said, breaking the dismal silence. We can't risk missing any again. Yusra slid a glance sideways at him. Daoud was the eldest of her brothers at 12, still a year younger than her. They needed a dragon. She'd be the one to manage it. Not Baba with his shaking hands and whisper soft voice. Not any of her brothers, all of them younger than her and placed into her keeping. So good. It's amazing as you read it too. I see all these little seeds that pay off later in the story. It's just <laughs> so tightly and well-written. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of fun working with a short story because, you know, we both write novels yeah, and they're chonky mm -hmm. and you, you can't like, there, to a certain extent, like, you know, when you're working with a 3000 word story, you can make every word count. You can make mm -hmm. it all wrapped together. And when you've got 100,000 or 130,000 words or totally. whatever it is, like there, it just like, you're still weaving everything together, but it doesn't have that same tightness. And it's just, I mean, it, I, I think it would be impossible if it did, it would be, <laughs> you, you would not, you would not be mentally well after <laughs> trying to do that. I know that's what I was going to say is I wish my brain was big enough to hold the whole novel in my head. Like I have yeah, to make notes, right. but I totally get what you're saying in a short story. Like you can see it all as like one moment or picture. Yeah. 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 Um, well, I think we should wrap it up there. But before we go, where can folks find you online? And do you have a recommended starting place for your other books? Sure. So um, I am Books by Intisar uh, pretty much everywhere. My website's uh, .com. My social media handles are Books by Intisar. Um, and I, um, I have two different series out. So I have The Dauntless Path that begins with Thorn. And you can definitely start there. 
um, trigger warnings for you know surviving abuse and violence against women generally, different kinds of violence against women. Um, you can also enter that series from the second book, uh, which is mm -hmm. A Theft of Sunlight. And then um, my other series is Sunbolt Chronicles, uh, which I uh, independently publish. And that one, the first book is Sunbolt, and that is uh, more of a, a seat of your pants adventure story mm -hmm. um, that's very fast moving and fun. Awesome. Uh, and of course, we do have an Alchemy of Sorrow anthology coming out in just a couple weeks, November 1st, whenever you're listening to this, November 1st, 2022. Um, and there'll be links to those and also to um, Intistar's website in the notes for the show. So check all of those out. And thank you so much for coming on. This is really lovely to chat. Thank you so much for having me. Lisa. This is lovely. For more information on Levi Jacobs and his books, including the award-winning Tide Collar Chronicles, visit www.levijacobs.com. Or for a free audiobook, only available to podcast listeners, go to www.levijacobs.com slash free. Thanks for listening, and read on.